Alors, euh, je vais présenter euh, Trevor. Je vais le faire en, en anglais. Euh, et puis, euh, <coughs> ensuite, euh, on, on, on écoutera euh, Trevor qui nous parlera euh, d'Angleterre. Alors, Trevor, il est euh, directeur de Wilberforce Institute for the study of slavery and emancipation at uh, Hull University, dans le Royaume-Uni, UK. Um, Trevor uh, has published extensively on Jamaica. He lived in Jamaica, he taught in Jamaica for a few years. He's, he is originally from New Zealand, by the way. And um, he also taught at Melbourne, so in Australia. And he's published also on Sadamang. He co-wrote a book on uh, comparing Sadamang to um, Jamaica. And he also recently published a survey of the historiography of early and revolutionary America. It's called Writing Early America, published by University of Virginia Press in 2023. And he's working, he just finished the manuscript of uh, an imperial history of the American Revolution uh, with Andrew O'Shaughnessy uh, to be published next year, I suppose. Um, Okay, uh, I know it's been submitted, so. and the title of his uh, paper is uh, The British Caribbean, the American Revolution, and the Problem of Loyalism, 1760-1788. Trevor. Thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Lachant. Uh, thank you very much, Eric and Marie, and I'm very sorry that I'm not able to be, uh, for medical reasons, um, I'm not able to be in London today. Uh, I was very much looking forward to it, uh, both meeting some new friends uh, and, of course, uh, of course, catching up with, I won't say old, uh, but I'll say long established uh, friends <laughs> in, 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 in Nam. Uh, one thing I guess I would want to say is that, that it's, uh, it's very good that, uh, that this, we're starting off, I think, with the British Caribbean as a paper, because that's not usually how we look uh, at uh, American, the American Revolution. Uh, and I should say that it, it, it's been very impressive to those of us in Britain, and I think also many of us in America, uh, just how how uh, how much work has been doing, doing and done uh, in France, particularly in America, 2026, uh, under Bertrand and Eric and other people, uh, to really to really see the, the the American Revolution in a global and worldwide context. And that'll be one of the things that I want to be looking at uh, today in particular. So I range reasonably widely, I, I think, but one of the points I would want to say is that, at the start off, is to say that it looks different, uh, the British Caribbean, uh, the American Revolution, if you approach it uh, from, say, Kingston, uh, or from a sugar plantation uh, in, the, in, in the west of Jamaica. And so what I'd like to start, I guess, with looking, at, is looking very briefly at the Hanover Slave Insurrection 1776. Uh, and this picture is, is anachronistic because it's about 1831-32. But I put it there because I wanted to say, well, this is what these enslaved rebels wanted to do, to tear down uh, slave plantations, to kill white people. Uh, I think that was, the, that, that was certainly the aim in one of the, the slave insurrections in 1776. Uh, and to set up principalities or, or kingdoms, uh, which was interestingly for in, in this period to be uh, divided between those people who are African born from Karamanti or from present day Ghana uh, and Igbo from present day southern Nigeria uh, as well as pre <coughs> native born slaves. Uh, and I mention this because it happened very soon after the Declaration of Independence. So one of the things to, 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 to suggest I guess about it is that there was a lot going on uh, around the time of the American Revolution and only some of it uh, was connected to what was happening uh, in Philadelphia uh, when, when Thomas Jefferson put forward the Declaration of, of, uh, of, of uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, the plot, which was a huge plot involving thousands of slaves, uh, was discovered 15th of July 1776 when an enslaved boy was discovered removing the musket balls from an enslaver's guns and was replacing them with cotton balls. Um, it hasn't been studied a great deal, this particular 
in its direction, which I think says something about uh, how the Caribbean, and the British Caribbean in particular, uh, still is marginal in many ways to accounts of the American Revolution. Uh, but I think it was something which was significant about it. Uh, the leaders of the conspiracy were apparently informed of the progress of the American Revolution and may have been influenced to, to revolt by its ideological content as well as the opportunity afforded by the removal of a military unit uh, from Jamaica. Uh, in other words, we might say that this was one of the direct consequences of the American Revolution. And what I want to say to the British, British Caribbean is that it's seldom direct involved with the American Revolution, but there were lots of consequences with it, which also had an effect on the American Revolution as well. Uh, it was, it was, as Andrew O'Shaughnessy says, uh, partly caused by the last lo loss of food imports from the mainland colonies, together with a severe drought, which provoked the slaves to rebel because they were angry too much with the white people because they had taken from them uh, their bread. Um, Although it, 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 it did not come to fruition, but it scared Jamaicans, uh, white Jamaicans, terrifically. Loads of ex executions and transportations, and extensive taking, taking of, uh, of of testimony. I can't, I can't spell it correctly there. Uh, of testimony <laughs> from terrified blacks gives us uh, an insight into what, well, partly what blacks were thinking at that particular time, but also into the mindset of white people. Um, Reverend John Lindsay uh, said it was the thought was directly connected to the American position. <coughs> In our late constant disputes, he said, at our tables, uh, where every person has his own waiting man behind him, I have, I'm afraid, we have, I'm afraid, been too careless of expressions, especially when the topic of the American Revolution had been uh, had been dwelt upon us by the be dealt upon us by the disaffected amongst us, dwelt upon and brandished off the strains of virtuous heroism. I start off with a slave insurrection because it brings, I think, one of the things which is increasingly important within the history of, of, of the American Revolution, and we'll talk about this later on, is where, but where slavery uh, ends up being. Um, and so it, it's appropriate, I think, to turn to, and you can see his estate, and you can also see him uh, at the far left uh, of this particular picture. Uh, Simon Taylor of Jamaica, the richest planter in Jamaica, owner of over, owner of over 2,000 enslaved people at his death in 1813, when he was one of the rare millionaires uh, in the British Empire. Taylor's interesting in, 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 in a number of ways, firstly because uh, he responded to the Hanover insurrection uh, in all sorts of ways, particularly on his estate, but also because of his views on the American Revolution, which give an insight into uh, the particular ways in which yeah, the American Revolution uh, might, 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 might have been viewed in that particular period. And I think that there's, there's a couple of things that, that I'd like to say about the American Revolution from a Caribbean perspective. One of the things which is often put forward in the literature is the question of why Jamaica did not rebel. And it always strikes me as that's a rather strange way of thinking about it, uh, because the default action was not to rebel, but was to stay loyal. And so one of the things in terms of talking about loyalists today is that places like the West, other like the British Caribbean, did not take an action so much uh, in regard to in regard to the American Revolution. They decided not to take action. They decided to stay loyal to Britain. One of the things which I think is uh, I've written about quite a lot is how that loyalty was not rewarded. Uh, one of the, the two of the things which happened immediately after the American Revolution. That uh, was a restraint on trade, so that so the West Indians could not trade uh, with North America, and most importantly, uh, the, 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 the beginnings of the abolitionist act movement uh, in the late 1780s, something which was connected to the American Revolution, but has major effect uh, on the West Indies. Uh, Taylor was very similar to many to many Jamaicans. Not all, but many Jamaicans, had always been very supportive of British actions. He tended to be uh, to be someone who, who thought very little about Americans in all sorts of ways. Uh, he, in 1774, uh, when the Coercive Acts were being put forward, he, he denounced American patriots as dogs that will bark that dare not stand with opposed, loud in mouth but slow to action. Uh, part of that 
part of that awkward derisory uh, relate relationship between Americans and West Indians, uh, where both sides thought very little of each other. And he thought with the coercive act that this that Britain was acting very, very, was it acting exactly uh, what in ways that it should have, have acted. After what the Americans have done, he said, Britain cannot give up the point, as it would only be making them more arrogant than they are at present. So mostly there was support for what British Britain was doing uh, in the American colonies, uh, as it would only be making them, as, 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 as it was thought, uh, that the harder that they, that they gave, did things to America, uh, the better it would be. And these were the sorts of views, I'd like to emphasize, these are the sorts of views that were heard in London, in London. When we want to ask why did Britain continue in its, its rather, rather foolish actions uh, towards America, we need to remember that the people they were listening to, not only people like Simon Taylor, but people like William Beckford, uh, the Lord Mayor of London and a very large slave owner in Jamaica, other people like them, all convinced them that if they acted fiercely, uh, that as in the West Indies, the colonists would, would do as they were told. But things, of course, didn't end up that way. And, and very soon, uh, very soon, the Americans, American fighting occurred, uh, and then there was the Declaration of Independence and war with America. Uh, Taylor thought this was truly alarming. And I think one of the things we're increasingly recognizing about the American Revolution uh, is that it disrupted a pretty well-functioning imperial system, and in particular an imperial system where goods from New England and the, and, and the northern colonies were sent to places like Jamaica and Barbados uh, to allow them to, to devote as much, much, much attention as they could to sugar planting, uh, providing sugar for, for Britain. Uh, the, the American Revolution, which, which the places like Jamaica were, were, were not so much participants but were observers of, uh, led to things which were truly alarming from Taylor's view. It led to the end of the slave trade, I think a very big deal for, for, for the Caribbean. Uh, it led to disruptions in provisions, uh, which led to starvation among uh, enslaved people. Perhaps 10, 15,000 people in Jamaica, perhaps 30, 40,000 people uh, in, the, in the Caribbean as a whole uh, starved or, 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 or suffered malnutrition uh, from, from uh, what was happening in America. And when we think of those figures, we need to remember that, that, that the losses of by battle in the American Revolution was only about 25,000. If you add the Caribbean in, uh, there were many more losses uh, of, of, of people uh, due to what was happening in this period. Uh, Taylor grew, grew so, so frustrated that by the dreadful year of 1781, the year after several hurricanes, uh, when France had entered the war, when Jamaica was suffering great privations, he grumbled he might leave Jamaica to go to some other government where he might be able to make a ship to live and not be held in Egyptian bondage. Well, taking aside the hypocrisy uh, of the greatest slave owner in, 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 the, in the British Empire, talking about being held, that he not be held in Egyptian bondage, it does say something about the desperate situation uh, for the war of independence for America. Why was it so different in the Caribbean uh, than other, other places? I think that one of the things that we need to, to, to keep in mind is that uh, only 13 colonies, this is well known of course, only 13 of the 27 colonies in the British Atlantic, uh, as the Queen will say about uh, uh, Duke of Sussex, uh, uh, opinions vary about how many colonies there were. It might be 26, it might be 27, it might be 31. But, but at least the majority of colonies in the Atlantic did not rebel in 1776. Um, and, it was, and it was a place where reform was needed. One of the things I think we need to, to, need to take into mind is at least for those people who were the beneficiaries uh, of the plantation system, who were making lots of money, uh, they felt in the 1760s and 1770s, not only were they doing it very well, but the reforms that Britain were doing uh, were very good. Uh, the Atlantic colonies that Britain retained during the age of revolution helped to undergo, undergo glo global transformations by providing wealth and power to Britain in a period when the Industrial Revolution was making it unprecedentedly rich. In short, British the West Indies had no desire to break away from Britain. The British action strengthened the system 
of which they were the, the chief beneficiary. Britain's restrictions on continental land acquisition affected the Caribbean not at all, uh, while the new ceded islands, taken away from France after the Seven Years' War, offered new opportunities to replicate the plantation complex. Uh, indeed, it was, it was Grenada, not Ohio, uh, which is where the big money went in the 1760s. Uh, with long experience as rulers of an oppressed labouring population, West Indian planters had no objection to the authoritarian government that Britain imposed on the former French and Spanish colonies, uh, and did not have the same sort of problems that North Americans had with that authoritarianism. <coughs> Uh, although they grumbled about the new commercial taxes and regulations, these measures strengthened the system of which they were the chief beneficiaries. Uh, unlike, unlike New England, West Indian planters craved the protection of royal military forces, and they were more than content with a closed mercantilist, mercantilist trade system. Uh, thanks, to their, uh, thanks, thanks to their immense wealth, the planter elite had strong representation in the parliament, they had easily the biggest lobby there, uh, and there was nothing in their history or aspirations for the future that pushed the planted class towards violent resistance. Their major concern was about the extensive prerogative of, of government in the, in, the, in the West Indies, and that was solved by, in the law case, uh, Campbell and Hall uh, in Antigua uh, in 1774. So they were pretty happy in many ways. Of course, they had had big things beforehand. Uh, one of the things that we might want to think about is if we look at the British Caribbean, uh, we might start the American Revolution earlier. I would talk with, say, start with something like Tacky's Revolt up in 1760, uh, not 1759. Here's a French print, uh, which, which was warning planters in San Domain uh, just of how violent enslaved people might be. Um, it was a revolt that started in uh, Jamaica in 1760, was not fully put down until 1761. Probably the most serious challenge to Britain by non-whites uh, until the Indian Mexico Mutiny of 1857. Uh, so it shocked what Jamaican whites out any complacency about their slave attitude to them uh, that they might have had. Which leads us to think about in what ways was uh, the West was slavery important uh, in, in the in the American uh, Revolution. Um, I think, that, I think that one of the things we can, we can say about it is that uh, slavery uh, it operated very differently uh, in the West Indies than it did in North America. And I must admit, as, a, as someone who, who reads about uh, reads the history of the American Revolution and looks in particular at uh, the current trend to say that slavery was a major cause uh, by which slavery, uh, by which the American Revolution occurred, uh, it seems very strange from a West Indian perspective. Uh, slavery is seen in things like the 1619 Project as encouraging Americans to become rebels. Uh, it was very different in the, West, in, in, in the West Indies. And I think if those people who, who see slavery as important in America need to think about the West Indies in this particular period. Um, Britain, in my opinion, was more the guarantor of slavery than its opponent. Uh, there was little abolitionist uh, ideas before 1780. The British Army supported slavery. Uh, the Britain in the 1760s and 1770s was unreservedly committed to the preservation and expansion of the Atlantic slave trade, slavery, and the plantation system. Uh, indeed, you only have to look at Tacky's revolt uh, just to see how uh, the, 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 the British government and the Jamaican government uh, put down that revolt with maximum violence to make it realize that if there had been any real, uh, real uh, prospect of slave rebellion in North America, uh, it would, the British government would have supported classes uh, rather than, than whites. Um, so slavery was something which probably kept uh, the British West Indies together. Um, historians tend to divide on this particular subject. The majority tend to think uh, that the huge disproportion between uh, of the of the, of the popular of the, of the, between the white and black population in the Caribbean, up to 90 percent black, uh, fewer than 10 percent white, uh, and the harshness of slavery, uh, the reality of slave revolution, uh, meant that, that, that whatever the Caribbean wants to do, whatever white West and white West Indians wants to do, uh, they were forced to stay loyal uh, out of fear of, uh, of of slave revolt. 
and certainly things like the 1774 Jamaica petition to the Continental Congress, uh, which said that we would like to support you, but we are too weak and we, we can't really do it because we're too many enemies, su supports that sort of, of view. I think, however, that there were many reasons that West Indians stayed loyal uh, besides slavery. Uh, slavery might have been a precondition, but there are other things why West Indians were loyal. In the first place, the demographic disasters uh, of white immigration, of, of, white, of white population in the West Indies, most, white, most whites did not live very long uh, once they got there, meant that the place was full of British migrants. And they had uh, had those sorts of, of ten, those sorts of uh, connections to, uh, to, to, the, to the West Indies uh, that were, were very important. Uh, they were also very hostile to, to New England, uh, so they were not very favorable towards Boston. The two cultures were very different uh, in all sorts of, of ways, uh, and, uh, and they welcomed British military culture. So there's a lot of things whereby you might say that there was really a tense, there was, there was no reason uh, for the for West Indians to do anything other than, than stay loyal uh, to, to Britain in what particular respect. Does the same view of West Indians, the same view of that the, the, the New West Indians have of New England was held by New Englanders of West Indians. So there was a good deal of opposition between these two parts of the empire, even though uh, they were very much uh, part of the same area. What is very interesting to me, I think, is just how little attempt there was uh, by Amer North Americans uh, to, to, to try and get uh, Caribbean support. And I think it's one of the things which is really very surprising. When the Jamaican Assembly sent a weak appeal to the Continental Congress in 1774, it was dismissed with withering scorn uh, that there was no real, uh, no, no, no real attempt to, to recruit West Indian state force. And quite, dis quite, quite differently uh, than what happened in Canada, when there was always the possibility that uh, people in French Canada and Quebec, uh, and particularly British people in places like Newfoundland, uh, could join uh, with the, with the rebell rebellious patriots in America. Uh, why did the Patriots not recruit the West Indians? I think this is an unexplored, unexplored question. It says something, says something about uh, differences between North America and the West Indies, uh, <coughs> competition, resentment, uh, the fact that, 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 that Americans really resented how West Indians were able to get their way in Parliament in ways that they weren't able to do. Uh, but it is still surprising. Uh, because one of the lessons that, that was learned in the 18th century was that if you wanted to destroy an army, uh, a European army, uh, which was usually subject to disease, the best way to do it was to send it to the Caribbean. Uh, if the Caribbean had joined America uh, in rebellion, if Jamaica, for example, would become the 14th uh, American rebellious colony, uh, it, would have, it would have meant that Britain would have had to send a huge army uh, to to, the, to, to Jamaica, most many of whom would have died in order to try and keep Jamaica from running off, running over. That's one of the, the lessons of the 18th century, uh, is that European armies could not really do what they wanted to do, uh, first in, in places like Jamaica, and then in San Domingue, and especially, of course, in Haiti in, the 17, Haiti in Grenada in the 1790s, with huge rebellions in those particular areas, um, that, 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 that they couldn't really do very much. So it is interesting why Jamaica, why Jamaica didn't do various, various things. Um, the American Revolution was pretty unfortunate uh, for uh, the West Indies up in all sorts of ways. Uh, it was unfortunate insofar as it led to an economic downturn. Uh, the most significant bit of it, which was the uh, the, at the end of the, of the slave trade, in, 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 in which would meant that uh, the demographic losses of that, that were apparent on plantations could not be made up by new additions of labor from Africa, uh, leading to starvation, to famine, etc. Uh, and, it, and it meant that there was uh, there was uh, there was very little that that, that that occurred in those particular places. Um, the big losers of the American Revolution were probably West Indian planters, uh, which says something about the, the, the problems of loyalty. Um, 
that eludes us in a variety of ways. Uh, their loyalty mattered uh, very little in the end uh, to a nation to a nation which was becoming increasingly abolitionist and who were determined to teach Americans a lesson uh, by not have, by continuing with the Hamsel's trade system uh, in the in the particular this particular region. Uh, the empire after 1783 was different from the one uh, that had existed in 1776 uh, insofar it was dominated by people of color rather than white Protestants claiming all the rights of Englishmen. Uh, Andrew Shaughnessy's title of his book on, on the Caribbean, the, the American Revolution in the Caribbean, is still the best account of this particular, uh, this particular episode, at least in English. Uh, an empire divided really says something very important about it. One of the major effect, one of the major consequences of the American Revolution is the slaveholding empire of, Brit of British America, which was partly in North America, but mostly in the West Indies, was very much broken. Uh, and it led to abolitionists having able, were able to do things uh, in terms of uh, attacking slavery, the slave trade and then slavery in the British West Indies uh, that would not have happened otherwise. Thomas Clarkson admitted this uh, in his biography in the, the autobiography in the 1830s, that without the loss of America, uh, we would not have been able to uh, have slavery. And I think that's less to do uh, with ideology. I don't think the American Revolution uh, did a great deal to enhance the ideas of black equality. And certainly in North America, we don't see, uh, we see slavery entrenched rather than uh, eliminated. But for the West Indies, it, it, it meant that, that, that they were more isolated uh, than they had done beforehand. For many people, that what this what this uh, wonder, makes people wonder about uh, is was the American Revolution a defi defining event uh, in British history, uh, in, in British West Indian history? Um, I mean, West Indians were loyal for a whole variety of reasons. I think T.J. Marshall sums up pretty well. Loyalists rejected American independence because they did not believe that Americans were a separate people, but with communities within the empire with rights and privileges of their own derived from the British Constitution. That's certainly how West Indians thought about it. Taylor initially thought the war might be might be a good thing, something that's like lasting the boil between two recalcitrant sides, so that good might come out of evil. But he was soon disavowed of that particular idea. He felt as loyalism was unrewarded as that madman Wilberforce was turning Britain against uh, the West Indies. But he could not move to the USA as he saw there the cant of philosophy, liberty and equality, which were the most pernicious vermin that had ever created, intended to overcome all established government, and in order to establish in their room murder, anarchy and confusion. Well, we might just take this as the ideas of an embittered man, albeit a very rich embittered man, uh, about uh, seeing his world uh, fall apart. The sort of things uh, that would come not only for people of, of wealth and status with the American Revolution, but even more so with the French Revolution. But what I think, I think what it does show is that when we think of the effect of the American Revolution on, on the West Indies, what we should concentrate on is something quite different than previous historians led by, by Eric Williams thought. Uh, the problems that white West Indians faced were mostly cultural and political, not economic. Uh, the plantations recovered remarkably quickly from the travails of war and revolution. The British public opinion had turned against West Indian planters. The American Revolution had shown uh, Britain's, uh, Britain's various deficiencies in the West Indian planter character. And their poor estimation of the West Indian planter as a social and cultural type that was amplified by the sudden birth of abolitionism in 1787 to 1788. West Indian planters came to realize that the real threat to their prosperity and position came from an assertive, cost out confident imperial state with moralizing attitudes and centralizing tendencies rather than, 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 than American patriots French invaders or potential slave rebels. Uh, it may some planters regret saying staying loyal to such a perfidious mother country. Uh, Simon Taylor may have been one of those who regretted his loyalty to a state that he believed had betrayed him. But when the unique thing they finished on, I think, is, and I'll, I'll mention this finally, 
uh, is we need to we need to, to finish with the majority of the inhabitants of the British Caribbean, which were the brutally treated uh, enslaved people uh, in this particular in this particular region. A uh, few of them played a direct part in the American Revolution. Most played a uh, played a passive role, uh, and and few accepted the idea that America stood for a universal liberty. Uh, it's noticeable that, that, that African Americans uh, <coughs> did not celebrate uh, the Fourth of July uh, after the, the, the women rested the white America celebrated it. Uh, they celebrated it at least from 1834. Uh, the day of celebration was the 1st of August, the anniversary of the emancipation of enslaved people from the British Empire. I want to finish by this great painting by, by J. M. Turner, uh, which is based on, uh, based on the, the notorious case of the Zong in 1781, which to my mind is one of the most significant but underappreciated things which came out of the British Carib Caribbean and the American Revolution. Uh, we can't really understand the Zong, uh, without understanding the commercial and political pressures that Jamaica was going under in 1780, which led to the decision to throw overboard uh, 134 enslaved people, two of whom claimed to back on again, so 132 died, and a subsequent court case. What the American Revolution did more than anything else uh, was not to harm the West, Indians, West Indian economy so much, people still wanted sugar, uh, and were prepared to pay for it, especially when San Germain fell apart in the 1850s, uh, but showed the moral bankruptcy uh, of people like Taylor uh, and, and, and people in the West Indies. Uh, so it brought, I guess, the West Indian planters to attention, the attention of the British public in ways that it hadn't done beforehand. So, I, in short, I think the study of the British, the British Caribbean uh, gives us many ways in where we can look uh, at the American Revolution from a different way, different viewpoint, and highlight all sorts of things which not only have an effect on the American Revolution, but tell us a lot about the making of the Atlantic world uh, in the late 18th century. So thanks very much. Thank you, Trevor. Um, <coughs> before we open the floor for questions, Three, th three remarks came to my mind after you know while I was listening to you. First, I think you show very well that the British Empire was a heterogeneous space, and because when you describe the way Jamaicans looked at uh, continentals, let's say, uh, it shows us how difficult it was for the thirteen colonies to be united. Because you might think that Georgians looked at people from Massachusetts you know, in the same way or vice versa. And the second thing is, I think your paper nuances the place of the of slavery in the American Revolution, as you stress. You know. And thirdly, the your paper um, sheds light on another dimension of loyalism, because for people who study uh, the American Revolution, loyalism is limited to refugees. Mm -hmm. That is, Americans who left um, you know, the 13 colonies, whereas there were loyalists everywhere in the British Empire. So I thought that was um, illuminating. So thank you. Uh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Do you mind me? Uh, uh, perhaps I'll just reply to you. Yeah, please, please. I think, I think that, that they're both all three very important. Uh, I think space is extremely important, and, and, the, and, the, and the viewing the American Revolution in a wider spatial capacity. Uh, is one of the contributions that our generation is making to this particular area. And I think that in the particular, this, this particular case, one, one of the things that we, we seldom appreciate is just how, the, how important the Continental Congress was, not so much just in uh, bringing forward uh, ideas, and, 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 uh, ideas and principles uh, to, to, uh, to, to challenge Britain, but for people who previously hadn't been connected. Uh, if the West Indians, West Indians had been invited to the Continental Congress, which they never were, uh, who knows what might have happened. There might have been a commonality of interests between them. Uh, it certainly would have meant, in terms of the slavery in American, the American Revolution, uh, which is an incredibly, uh, an incredibly contentious uh, issue in historiography and very difficult to, to, to know about. I think there are a couple of things that we can, put, we, we can say. Firstly, uh, the, the, 
idea that slavery caused the American Revolution uh, is hard to defend once you put the West Indians into that, that, that box. The second thing is that uh, it's very hard to see the Constitution working out the way that it did uh, if the West Indies were, the West Indies were still, still involved in, the, in, uh, in America, or if the American Revolution hadn't, hadn't occurred. Abolitionism would have been would have played out very differently both in the British Empire and in North America uh, if, if the West Indies remained part. If there had no, there had been no American Revolution, or if the Caribbean had joined in the American Revolution, and I think the third thing with loyalism was absolutely correct. I mean, loyalism is a much bigger factor than we think. Uh, we probably don't want to include enslaved people or Native Americans as loyalists. I think that would be taking it too far. But certainly if you think of the whites in Ireland, you think of the whites in the Caribbean, uh, you think of the British people in general, there was a lot more support for loyalism within the British Atlantic Empire uh, than we think. Mm. Uh, and I think that that's just one reason why I think increasingly people are looking at loyalists uh, as a much, much stronger group within, Atlantic, within the, in the American Revolution than we previously recognised. They're not marginalized people at all. Simon Table and Taylor is not a marginal group. <laughs> I have a specific question. Uh, I've been working closely on Continental Congress, and I saw that in the fall 17, in fall 1775, they, they wrote um, an address to the Jamaicans. And I was wondering, do you know how it was received in Jamaica, or if it ever got there? It got there, it just, it just sort of went something. And partly, it, partly the, the, the address was so um, unwelcoming, withering, withering scorn as much as anything. It was pretty much as like thank you for your thank you for your words, but we don't really care about what your words were. You're not mm. any, real, any real help. That uh, it really it it, 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 it it shows that there was a big gap between the West Indies and the and, and America. I think American revolutionaries uh, just correctly perceived uh, that the West Indies were going to stay loyal to Britain, whatever happened, and they were going to be their enemies rather than their friends. Mm. Euh, tu, tu répètes la question peut-être oui. Je suppose que c'est un euh, je, je la demande français ou en anglais euh, <rire> Comme tu veux. Bon, tu vois la traduire. Ça, ça. Non, 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 la, la question, c'est qu'en fait, Prévoir a montré que le... que le... que le... comment dire... que, que les... enfin, la Jamaïque restait euh, loyale pour continuer à bénéficier de la protection face au risque d'une révolte euh, d'esclaves. Mm -hmm. Et en même temps... Euh, est-ce que le, le risque, du, enfin le danger français, joue aussi dans euh, tu vois, la nécessité de rester loyal pour être protégé euh, mm. éventuellement en cas de guerre euh, Ce qui n'était plus le cas en, en Amérique du Nord, puisqu'il n'y a plus de français. Quoi. Enfin, il n'y a plus de territoire français. Une question de Eric. Vous avez le fait que part of the reason to remain loyal was um, protection, the need for protection against uh, slave insurrection, uh, protection um, by the British military. Uh, but what about the French danger? And as opposed to North America, because France no longer had troops in North America. So was it a, a factor too? It was a very large factor. I think not so much uh, in the lead up to the American Revolution, but certainly during the American Revolution itself. Um, one of France's ambitions, and Eric, Eric, of course, has written very well on this, one of France's ambitions was to um, acquire for itself dominance in the, in the British, in, in the Caribbean, through attacking the British Caribbean. Uh, and, and certainly from 1778 onwards, the Caribbean becomes a major theatre. And it's not only true for West Indians, who obviously are always worried about the French threat. It becomes true for the British government. George III, uh, after 1778, pretty much accepts that the British American colonies are going to have independence, and his, his concern is mostly to stop France acquiring places like Jamaica. And of course, 1782, the threat to Jamaica was very real. A huge number of soldiers were sent to San Domingue, uh, and one of the things which I think is always underappreciated is that the, if we add the number of casualties uh, from disease of French 
Frenchmen dying, French soldiers dying in, 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 in Saint-Domingue. It makes it the most expensive military part of the whole war. I think 7,000 people died in Port-au-Prince uh, from disease in that particular period. Uh, and the fact that, the, the, the fact that under Admiral Rodney, uh, the French were defeated in 1782, he encouraged the Britons, all Britons almost think that they had won the war. Mm -hmm. um, because that's one of the more one of the more surprising things is is why did Britain um, why did Britain accept the loss of the American colonies in general with so little with, with, with so little concern and partly was it was because they felt that they had beaten the French in the Caribbean uh, and kept the most valuable parts of the empire to the British West Indian colonies to themselves mm -hmm. uh, and then therefore had given France a bloody nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I have a question regarding the, the first, uh, the, the commercial treaty, the first phase of the commercial treaty after 1783. And Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering, Trevor, what about the, the, West, the, the representation of the West Indian planters? I, I work on Canada, obviously, and Canada is going to be part of, a, the sort of re creating a new sort of triangular trade after 1783. Uh, and the West Indians and particularly Jamaicans don't want to work with Canada at all. They think they cannot feed them or whatever. But I was wondering what were the arguments used by the West Indians when they presented their case because they wanted to continue trade with the Americans, obviously, after the after that after the war. Uh, and um, were they what happened to their loyalty then to the you know the, to, to to the empire because they were really pushing for more free trade and supported by Shelburne actually even Pitt at some point so so what sort of representation did they have in uh, in Britain of their their rights regarding trade? Well, as, as with the previous question, this is a very appropriate question. I don't, I, I don't, don't know enough about the details right. okay. to give you a real answer. But what I can say is that is, 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 is the larger context is that this was the first time that West Indian lobbyists in Parliament had not got their own way over something which intimately concerns the West Indies. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, whenever whenever an issue had come up to do with the British West Indies, West Indian lobbyists said, "We're the experts. <coughs> we're, we're the experts, and we will." Um, we, we can give you advice, and that advice has always been accepted. This was the first time, first time on a serious issue uh, that West Indians did not get their way. And it didn't destroy their loyalty straight away, but it severely shook it. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and, and I think this was one of the things that in the 1780s, there was a slow realisation among West Indian planters and merchants uh, that their privileged position within the empire, their belief that they were absolutely essential mm -hmm. to imperial prosperity and that Britain would do nothing to harm that, uh, started to really get shaken. Mm -hmm. In the first example out of 1772 in the Somerset decision, yeah. uh, which, which, which Western the implanters felt amusing and uh, an insult, but didn't really matter that much. But it really did matter with, the, with what happened in the 1780s and free trade. Why they did not have, have any connections with Canada? Well, I think that's a really interesting question. I hope you'll be able to yeah. give some answers yeah. to that. Because that's not <laughs> something I know about, and, and I've always, I, I must say, I've always wondered why uh, why there was so little, so little connection. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, my presumption is the West Indians thought Canada was just a place of ice. And, uh, yeah, that's so exactly that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Trevor.